a real pleasure to be here in front of this uh, distinguished audience. Um, so um, we had a bit of a slow start, so um, I'm going to speak very, very quickly, and I'm going to uh, open the fire hose of information on you, um, at least if the first slide shows up. Here we go. Um, so I'm going to start with a bit of a uh, state of the art of AI, what we can do today. Uh, a little bit about what we can expect in the near future, and also about the limitations of AI and what are the challenges for the next few years. And then um, uh, I'll speak a little bit about the consequences for society, although I would go on a limb because it's really not my expertise. Um, so um, AI, of course, has had different uh, definitions over the years. Um, it started um, in, in, the, in the 50s, but started being a little bit... Um, uh, successful in the 80s with what was uh, called expert systems. And an expert system is something that someone sits down and writes by hand. And that turns out to be a big challenge to build intelligence systems, to have to write all the rules that would uh, govern its behavior. So what's happened over the last uh, 20, 30 years so, or so is uh, the use of machine learning. And more recently, uh, a set of techniques that uh, really had their root th about 30 years ago, but um, have become successful only in the last few years called, called deep learning. Um, and that's what we call the new AI. So the reason we hear about AI uh, today is because of the emergence of deep learning and all the applications it uh, en enables. So let me start um, by explaining a little bit what machine learning is. So let's say you want to train a machine. So when I say train a machine, it's, it's a program really on the computer, but it's a program where um, a lot of parameters are left free if you want. So it's symbolized by this panel with knobs. So you can think of it as uh, something with knobs on it that you can adjust. And if you want to train a machine to, for example, distinguish images of cars from images of airplanes, you show it thousands of examples of cars on airplanes. Every time you show it an example of a car, if it doesn't turn on the light for the car, you, you, told, you, told, you told it you're wrong, and it adjusts its parameters so that next time around that this is the same picture, the answer will be closer to what you want. And the magic of it is that if the machine is, is built properly, or the program is written properly, um, uh, with enough examples, the machine will eventually learn to associate uh, uh, the, the proper label to every image. So it's going to be able to recognize any car or any airplane, even the weird looking ones in this picture. So um, uh, that idea has been around for a very long time, since the late 50s, and it's been in very wide use. Um, by companies like uh, Google, Facebook, and, and many others uh, for, for about, about 20 years. Um, but what's, what deep learning is, is, uh, is something about the internal structure of those machines. So uh, while in the past there were what we call shadow, um, now they are, those machines are composed of multiple layers of processing. Um, I'm not going to go into the technical details, but um, uh, those machines are a particular instance of what we call neural networks, artificial neural networks. And because they are entirely trainable, that opens the door to many more applications that we were able to do in the, in the past. And that allows us to also to reduce the amount of uh, expert manual labor, if you want, to build those machines. So whereas in the past there was uh, uh, a, a piece of the work that consisted in designing most of the system and engineering it, uh, right now, we just uh, take kind of a standard uh, uh, deep learning uh, framework or algorithm, and we turn the crank, train it with lots of data, and you know, usually it works pretty well for a lot of applications. So that um, democratized a little bit the, um, uh, the use of, uh, of machine learning. Uh, it also made it work better. So it started, uh, when I started working on this at Bell Labs in the, in the late 80s, uh, we could do things like recognize characters. And in fact, that was very successful, but we didn't have a lot of data sets on which we could train those systems. Um, the only data sets for which there was sufficient data was things like handwriting recognition or speech recognition. We could never apply it to other things because we just didn't have the data. Also, the computers were very slow. So we had to wait until the mid-2000 um, to do other things, like say, for example, drive robots. So this is a, a project I worked on uh, the first few years I was at NYU. And uh, we were able to train uh, one of those deep learning systems, wasn't called deep learning at the time, uh, to uh, essentially drive a robot off-road and avoid obstacles. And the system more or less kind of trained itself, which is, which is um, um, very, uh, uh, very interesting. Um, so uh, what happened uh, more recently around uh, 2010, 2012, is that um, 
uh, a new type of computer appeared, GPUs. So these are the computers that are built to do the graphic, graphic rendering for games, essentially. But they turned out to be very efficient as well for numerical calculation. Um, and uh, a number of different groups, uh, starting with our friends at University of Toronto, implemented what's called a convolutional net. So this is a bit of my invention from back at Bell Labs in the 80s. And they made a, built a very, very large convolutional net, trained on a very large data set, and beat uh, uh, the record on image recognition that, that uh, uh, were standing at the time by a very large margin. And that caused a revolution in computer vision where everybody started, basically stopped everything they were doing and started using those methods because the, the performance was so much, uh, so much higher. And this is probably the single most important event in AI that happened over the last 10 years. And uh, this is what caused the, uh, the AI revolution that we know today. Um, so over the last few years, there's been a, a sort of explosion of uh, innovation in this, uh, in this domain. Uh, again, the, the root of this goes back to the, the mid 80s. Um, and to give you a, a, an example of where computer vision sits today, we, stands today, we, we, um, here is an example of what a computer vision system can do. This is a system that was built at Facebook over the last few months. And you can give it an image and it will outline every object um, with sort of precise outline uh, and identify them. Um, um, you know, wine glasses, wine bottles, tables, the computers in the back, the, the people. Uh, you can count sheep with it um, or, you know, do all kinds of uh, things. It works amazingly well. And the, the progress has, ha, in this domain has been stunning. So if five years ago uh, a, uh, a computer vision researcher had been asked, you know, how long is it going to take for us to get this kind of performance, uh, probably the answer would have been uh, a very long time. And we've seen some example uh, yesterday by uh, Lily Peng from Google of applications of this to uh, medical image uh, analysis. And there is a number of those applications. I think the two most visible applications that are going to pop up and have a big influence on society over the next few years are in, uh, in uh, medicine, uh, particularly in radiology, but also in personalized medicine and, and genomics. And the second one would be in transportation for self-driving cars, autonomous cars. So the techniques that are used in self-driving cars are the same, and in uh, image, uh, medical image analysis, are the same, that essentially the same method that we used for handwriting recognition back uh, 30 years ago, uh, with very little difference, basically a difference in scale. But other than that, very little difference. So that gives us kind of a, a, a hammer, and every problem now looks like a nail. We can, we can sort of bang on the head of every problem we encounter. Um, and uh, you know, build cars that, that, that drive themselves. Uh, we can also do translation with those systems. And again, they are very similar in flavor to uh, what, what, uh, what we built. Um, so there is issues, though, with those methods. They, they are not the solution to AI. We're not going to be able to build truly intelligent machines with those techniques. Um, so uh, supervised learning requires too many training samples. So there's a lot of problems for which, in medicine in particular, for which we don't have a lot of samples. And, and we can't really apply those methods there, at least not yet. Um, and there is, you know, various problems in uh, the fact that those uh, systems reflect the biases that are present in the data. So that requires a bit of work to uh, uh, massage the data in the appropriate way. Um, and, you know, as I said, supervised learning is insufficient to, uh, to, to produce true AI systems. Um, there's actually three types of learning in the context of machine learning. One is called supervised learning that I just talked about. There's another one called reinforcement learning. Many of you may have heard of AlphaGo uh, and AlphaGo Zero, produced by our friends at DeepMind. Um, and that's trained by reinforcement learning. So it's a slightly different mode of uh, training where the machine is uh, not told the correct answer to uh, what to produce, but is just being told whether it's correct or not, whether whatever output it produces is correct or not. And that works really well for training a machine to play games. Unfortunately, it doesn't work very well for real world applications. There's a third type of learning called unsupervised learning, which I'll come to in a minute. But reinforcement learning works well for training machines to play game, Go, chess, Doom, uh, StarCraft, etc. StarCraft is still working uh, practice. It doesn't really work in the real world because it requires too many samples. So um, if we want to use reinforcement learning to uh, train a self-driving car to drive itself, it will have to drive off a cliff about 50,000 times before it realizes <laughs> it's a bad idea. And, <laughs> and maybe another 50,000 before it realizes how not to run off a cliff. So obviously, we don't learn this way. Um, we tend to be able to learn to drive without driving off cliffs too many, too many times. Um, 
So what, uh, what, what is it? So what, what can we do with uh, current AI systems, right? So we can do, we can have safer cars, better medical image analysis, you know, adequate language translation, not perfect, far from that. And numerous applications, every, every you know, new applications pop up every, every day. But what we cannot have is machines with common sense, machines that we can talk to and that are not frustrating uh, to talk to. Um, you know, intelligent personal assistants, for example. We, we can't have that yet. Um, you know, smart chatbots, household robots. We like a robot that can actually, you know, do work in our house. Um, agile and dexterous robots. Um, you know, a house cat has more common sense and more agility than the best robots that we have. Um, so I would, I would consider it a, uh, a major success if by the end of my career, which is coming fast, um, <laughs> We, uh, we had a, ro a robot that, was, that had as much common sense and agility as a cat. So the next revolution will not be supervised. That, that's insufficient. We'll, we'll need new techniques uh, for, for that. And the question, of course, is can machines learn like humans? And humans are amazing at learning. Babies learn at incredible speed. Uh, they learn sort of basic physics. They learn how the world works by observation, essentially. We'd like to be able to do this with machines. Um, Emmanuel Dupoux, who is a, a cognitive developmental psychologist in Paris, has this uh, beautiful chart where he plots what uh, type of uh, skills are acquired by babies at what age. Um, this is in month. So things like object permanence, the fact that there is animate and inanimate objects, etc. The notion of gravity, inertia, etc. That's learned around the age of eight months. So before eight months, if you show a baby oops, sorry, uh, something like, uh, like this, a cart that floats in the air. They say, sure, that's the way the world works, no problem with that. <laughs> After eight months, when they've, they've figured out what gravity is all about, they look, they look at it like this. <laughs> um, because they've learned a model of the world. By observation, you know, babies don't act very much in the world, you know, very little. So how do we do this with machines? You know, here is a baby orangutan. Uh, these guys are almost as smart as we are. And this guy is playing a magic trick on, on him, uh, removing an object from the cup and then showing the cup, and the cup is empty. And the baby orangutan is <laughs> rolling on the floor. <laughs> so they have, you know, they're incredibly smart. They can use tools, they can build their house, they, you know, they have common sense uh, more than, they're not social animals, they don't have language. They don't interact with, uh, you know, much with other animals of their, of their kind. Um, how, how, do we, how do we do this? How do we reproduce this with machines? And so that's something called uh, predictive learning or unsupervised learning, and we're, we're doing experiments with this we're, with some ideas that don't work yet, or at least not well, but we're trying to get machines to predict the future, basically. So show a piece of video to a machine and ask it what is gonna, what's gonna happen next. And if the machine is able to predict what's gonna happen next, perhaps it has some idea of how the world works. And uh, you know, we can call this predictive learning, self-supervised learning, imputative learning if we're pedantic. Um, but uh, that's, the, that's, that's the basic idea we're working on uh, to allow uh, machines to, to learn like, uh, like animals and, and, and humans. Um, those are uh, predicted videos. So the, there's an initial segment of the uh, video being shown to the machine and then it has to invent the rest of the video. So it invents this bookcase here. It, it's never seen this before. Uh, it's been trained on uh, videos of uh, New York apartments and it you know, figures out that if you have the start of a couch, the rest of the couch must be there too. Um, you know, you can predict the behavior of cars running around and, you know, it's very useful when you drive if you can predict what the other cars are going to do. That, that is, and if you can predict what your car is going to do, this is what's going to prevent you from running off cliffs 50,000 times. Um, uh, so this is an experiment that was done by um, uh, colleagues at NVIDIA, the company that produces the GPUs, very recent uh, paper, and uh, these faces are faces of celebrities. These are non-existing celebrities. So what they did is train a particular type of neural net called a, a generative adversarial network. Um, the idea came, came out of the University of Toronto a few years ago, and we've been very active in this as well. And you train it on lots of pictures of celebrities, and then you feed it a random vector, and out comes a picture of a celebrity that doesn't exist. <laughs> and so those are fake pictures. Um, they look really nice, very high resolution, 1,000 by 1,000 pixel, um, pretty amazing. Um, you can also, this is worked on at, at Facebook uh, in Paris where you can uh, take a picture of someone and make that person older or younger, uh, more, you know, uh, 
uh, more male or more female, uh, you know, in various ways. So it gives you kind of some control. And so I think those kind of tools are going to be very useful for sort of creative, um, 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 sort of helping with uh, creating content, essentially. Giving uh, uh, cre creativity uh, power to people who don't necessarily have the technique for, for, uh, uh, artist, um, for art. Okay, so a couple of predictions, and I'll end with this. Um, the emergence of AI is going to change the value we attribute to things. And there, again, I'm going on a limb. I'm not an economist, but you know, I talk to a lot of them. Um, so you can today uh, go on Amazon uh, in the US, and I think it's probably similar here, and buy a Blu-ray player for $47. It's very cheap. It's an incredibly sophisticated piece of technology. It's essentially built by machines. You want a handmade ceramic bowl. Technology has been around for about 8,000 years. <laughs> uh, it costs you uh, $750. Um, just, just do a Google search. You know, you'll, you'll, you'll find those. Um, you want to download a recording of uh, Mozart the Zauberflöter? Seven bucks. A ticket at the New York, <laughs> uh, New York uh, uh, Met and Lincoln Center? 800 bucks. That's the most expensive one. Okay, the cheap ones are <laughs> maybe 200 bucks, something like that. So what's the difference? What, what, why is it that there's such a difference in price? What, what, we, what we give value to is authentic human experience. When someone is really involved in, in building the thing or uh, there is a direct relationship, direct human relationship, that's what is going to increase in value. And material goods are going to go down in value like crazy because they're going to be built by machines and to some extent designed by machines. Um, so it's going to change the, the, the value we, we, we give to things. I think there is, I'm, I'm a big uh, fan of uh, jazz music and I think there's a bright future for jazz musicians because it's all about the instantaneous communication of human emotions. Um, uh, a second remark, um, I was very worried for a few years that um, the accelerated progress of technology was going to leave a part of the population behind. So as technology evolves, more and more people are kind of uh, left behind who, whose skills are not in, in phase with what society requires. Um, and so, you know, obviously the solution is to invest in education. But what, was, uh, what I learned by talking with uh, economists like Eric Brynjolfsson, for example, at MIT, is the fact that the speed at which a technology diffuses in society and the economy is actually limited by how fast people learn to use it. So it's kind of a two-way street. Um, it takes about 10 to 20 years for a technology to really diffuse in all corners of the economy, and it's limited by how fast people can train for it. So if there is one recommendation for any country to um, um, deal with the transformations that will be brought by AI is education, invest in education. Um, and uh, so um, when will the, the true AI revolution occur? Well, um, you know, when we figure out how to train machines the way uh, babies, uh, babies train, and it could take two 5, 10, 20, 30 years, we don't know. We don't have the principles, we don't have the math, we don't have the techniques, we have a lot of ideas, they don't quite work yet, so it might take a while. And the hope is that uh, people funding this research will not get tired before we actually find a solution. <laughs> um, I am not a believer in the singularity. So the singularity is this event by which um, you know, somehow computers become more intelligent than humans and then they build computers are even more intelligent than themselves and they kind of, you know, uh, uh, go right past us and, and we have no control. I'm, I'm, I don't believe in this concept at all uh, because there's friction terms in there that are forgotten. Um, computers will not take our jobs. They will enhance or and amplify our intelligence. Um, there will be disruption, there's no question. Will they want to take over the world? Uh, no, because that's a very sort of projection of all the defects of uh, human nature, if you want, to think that a computer will want to take over the world. Uh, the, the desire to take over the world, as we well know, um, you know, by looking at some of our politicians, is, um, is not correlated with intelligence. Um, it's, it's, it's correlated with testosterone, perhaps. And, and I, I don't think a robot will have testosterone. Um, 
Okay, so I'm going to end here uh, with just a sli slightly philosophical remark, which is that uh, we, we have the technology for AI, at least part of it. We don't have the science for, of intelligence. And it's been the case in, in history that uh, technological artifacts motivated scientists to come up with theories that explained it. And so thermodynamics appeared after the steam engine was invented. And, um, um, you know, um, aerodynamics was invented after the airplane was invented, basically. And, and so, you know, information theory after communication, radio communication uh, started appearing. So um, what is the science of intelligence? What is the equivalent of thermodynamics for intelligence? And that's the quest of my uh, scientific uh, career, essentially. Thank you very much. Fantastic. Fantastic presentation. Thanks. I think we have a few minutes for <clears throat> some questions and answers, so I'll just kick off. Uh, <clears throat> I think it's, uh, th it's be this beautiful expression that, you know, now we have a hammer so everything looks like a nail, but yet we do still have some fundamental limitations to what contemporary machine learning and deep learning can do. And I love this example of a, of a cat or an agile, an agile robot. What will it take for us to get to machines that have common sense and might help us make that next level of development? So I'm, I'm fond of saying that uh, uh, intelligence is, the, the essence of intelligence is the ability to predict. Mm. And, and so that's why I talked a little bit about prediction, or ability to predict the consequences of our actions, or predict what's gonna happen in the world because the world is being the world, um, is, is really what allows us to uh, plan and, uh, and, and you know, to take advantage of the world, mm. essentially. So, um, um, how, how do we get machines to, to learn models, of, predictive models of the world? That's really the big question there. And there is very sort of mathematical, technical questions uh, be, uh, below this, which is um, um, how do we deal with prediction under uncertainty? So if I, um, if I take a, a pen and I, I, I put it on a surface like this and I tell you I'm going to lift my finger, you can all predict that the pen is going to fall. But you can't, probably can't predict in which direction, even I can. Um, <laughs> and so the, the problem is that there is intrinsic uncertainty in there. We, you, so the techniques that, that we've developed for supervised learning don't deal with this kind of uncertainty very well. We can't really use them to train a machine to predict when there are multiple possible answers, mm -hmm. essentially. So that's the technical problem we have to solve. Okay. Um, the framing of these, this morning's session is around an AI moonshot. As we know, the actual moonshot in the United States took around 2 to 3% of the entire nation's GDP for several years to pull off the, the moon mission. Uh, in contemporary, contemporary situations, we see China devoting an extraordinary amount of resources, far more funding to AI research than, uh, than any other country. What does the moonshot look like for AI in the context of today's geopolitical con situation? Well, I think there are several, several moonshots, and, and you know, I, I like to believe I'm part of at least two of those. Um, so, so first of all, a number of countries have uh, developed strategies uh, uh, around AI. Uh, the Obama administration in its last uh, few weeks actually published a, a report uh, on a strategy which was ignored by the next uh, uh, government. Um, uh, Canada has a strategy and massive investment. China has one. France is about to publish one in the next month. Um, uh, UAE has one as a minister of AI. My boss. Exactly. Um, so I, I think, I mean, certainly the topic has gathered a lot of interest but from governments around the world. It's a very important issue. Um, now, what, you know, what, what does the moonshot look like? There's, there's several um, uh, issues. One is, even if we don't do research anymore, we, we stop all the research we do, we only try to apply the techniques that we already know, there's a lot of work to do. Um, I think there's uh, a lot of applications. We discover them every day. I'm sure you probably know more of those than I do because you are exposed to all those people who come up with ideas and startups. Um, so I, uh, just that, I think, is going gonna, is gonna to keep, keep people busy for a long time. And it's, that's relatively applied, applied research and development. And then there is the, 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 the more ambitious moonshot, which is how do we solve the general intelligence mm -hmm. problem, make machines that have common sense, mm -hmm. et cetera. And I think you're going to see a bunch of uh, government-funded program around the world on that theme because a lot of people now are perceiving, perceiving that this is the, the challenge for the next few years. Fantastic.